Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of What the Field, a place where the environment matters. I'm Emmeline. And I'm Christina. Today we will be talking about everyone's favorite addiction, coffee. And we're very happy to be joined by Maria Palacio, CEO and co-founder of the coffee company Progeny. So hi Maria, thank you so much for being with us today and dedicating uh, some of your no doubt uh, little time to us. Yeah, thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here with you guys um, and having this important conversation. So Maria, tell us a little bit about yourself and about Progeny. How did you come to found it? What's your story? Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, I am from Colombia. As you, if you're drinking our coffee, as you know, our coffee comes from Colombia. And I was born and raised in a Colombian coffee farm. So that makes me a fifth generation Colombian coffee farmer. So very much coffee has been in my veins, my inheritance and so on. But um, as I was growing up, I remember everything being really hard. Like there was always the conversation, things are hard, they're not being profitable, um, they're just not working. And came to the realization that usually farmers produce about 15% below margin. And so I remember growing up in an agriculture family, for me it was kind of crazy why we were still agriculture, like in the agriculture field, if we were not making money. And it was always in that depth to depth, uh, like looking for that day that we will hit the right price, that will never come. And so eventually I made it to the U.S. because it's like, you know, this is for me just I thought this is insane that this is how we operate. So I wanted to do something completely different from my family. I arrived to New York to work in fashion and there I got the realization like, wow, everybody has a cup of coffee. Um, and in outside of the, you know, of Colombia, people are drinking more, more coffee. Uh, they're willing to pay more for the cup of coffee. Second most traded com commodity, uh, second beverage, most consumed beverage in the world. And so I was seeing this fast growing market. And yet when I will travel back to Colombia, that was not the reality for our community and in general in coffee uh, grower families. And so that really sparked the inside of me and with my co-founder, co uh, co John Travelsi. Um, and so we asked the question, how can we create a sustainable coffee chain out of circular economy that actually brings high value to the farmers as well as our consumers, bringing high quality uh, products? Um, and we start with, you know, just with the base, uh, you know, profit should come at the expense of poverty. And so we launched Progeny Coffee in 2016 with a mission to leave farmers out of poverty. And there's where we embarked the journey on creating this whole sustainable chain that I, I will, I'm happy to share more. So, Maria, you just said that uh, the farmers are not paid uh, fairly, but we've also heard that the coffee industry is very volatile, and uh, I, I guess farmers are very uncertain because of this, and, and their, their business is very unstable. Um, and this is something we at Crowd Farming try to tackle, too. How is uh, Progeny facing this? What's, what's the normal supply chain, and how are you kind of changing the status quo? Yeah, so if you think about the, um, in general, the supply chain, it takes about 10 different steps from the moment the coffee leaves the farmer until it arrives to your, to your door. Um, and also, if you think about it, it takes to the farmer three years to grow that plant of tree to get you that cup of coffee. It takes the roaster 12 minutes to roast you that cup of coffee, and it takes the barista five minutes to brew you that cup of coffee. And so if we see that, we usually we tend to hear about the roasters, which is great, uh, but then we leave out the farmer who spent three years actually uh, growing that plant of tree. And so that you put us into perspective. And like you're saying, yes, the prices are very volatile and it doesn't consider if your, um, your cost of production, which is something that I know uh, crop farming speaks a lot also, like how come, you know, we're in, it's a business where you produce without not knowing how much you're paying going to pay for. Um, and so we created a platform called Beyond Trade, where we deliver fruitcation technical support to the farmers. And we take them to a journey from sh shifting their commodity farmers into sustainable, sustainable farming, and increasing their quality. At that moment, we created our own price sheet um, that does not, it's not with the stock market, it doesn't go up and down, but it's stable based on scoring. So if you think on those who knows about wine, coffee is more complex than wine and it has a score. It goes from one to a hundred. 
So 80 points and above is considered specialty coffee. 85 points and above is considered specialty excellence coffee. And that's where we always sit in that 85. So we take the farmers into that journey because the moment they hit specialty level, they're able to access to more, um, more, more capital. Um, and so we set out our price sheet where um, depending on the scoring, they could access more, um, more a, a better price for, for their crop. Um, and that's something that has been a game changer because suddenly they know how to, they know how much they're going to make. They know how much to then put into and invest into their land. Um, so that's a little bit of what, and then, you know, outside of a whole sustainable um, initiatives that we have at the farm level to maintain and make sure that they keep the quality. One thing that is different and you're going to notice in the mainstream is that when you see a, a coffee that is over roasted, usually is, um, and those coffees that are really black and shiny with oils, um, it means that most of the time they use a bad coffee because the moment you take it to a high roast, you are burning everything. So you're not able to, to taste even the chemicals that were inside the coffee. And that's a way for them to use a lot of coffee commodity below 80 points and make sure that you don't, in the palate, you're not able to taste all those damages. Um, so you'll notice in specialty coffee, that's why even if our coffee comes as espresso, it's not dark, but the flavor will be bold because um, quality should come from the source, not at the roast level. Maria, regarding the, the commodity that, that you were speaking about, this is a very interesting topic for us. So, for example, you said, uh, like, we've read that around 20 million smallholders are producing up to 80% of the co of the coffee globally. I have two questions regarding this. First, how can we trace the coffee we're drinking if it's produced by so many small holders? And then if it's a commodity, if, how can a producer or a brand dif differentiate in this context? Yeah, it's an incredible question. Um, and I think it's that for you to be able to trace back, I think as a consumer, it's, it's really challenging, especially if you're if you go to the mainstream in the commodity, because that just goes through so many different middlemen and they, you know, farmers just come and they put their coffee and it goes all mixed up and, and you lose full traceability. And so I feel like in that moment for you to really understand, you need to partner well with, um, with, with companies that are actually tracing back and working along with the farmers. You'll find a lot of companies, of course, because they're not from the source, they source well, um, but very few are the ones that uh, work directly with the farmer and bring you that coffee from the farmer to the door. So I feel like there is a little bit of research of who you're partnering with and who you're drinking from. Um, another thing that is very, that people usually don't know, which um, it's around certifications, where they tend to buy based on certifications But if you think about it, um, farmers are already losing money and certification is very costly for them. And so um, most of the time, let's say the cooperatives are the ones that are certified, not the farmers. And so you're drinking a coffee thinking it's fair trade, but in reality, the farmers were not fair trade. It was just a commodity, uh, the, uh, the cooperative or the milling process. And so there is a little bit of that disconnection. And that's where, um, If you notice with progeny coffee, we don't mix or blend any coffee. So you get the coffee of that farmer. Um, and that's why it has a picture of the farmer and that full traceability. Here in, U in US, we, uh, we market through our adopt the farmer model. So in instead of you choosing a blend, you actually get to adopt the farmer to maintain that traceability. And likewise, we do with um, all the crowd farmers where we make sure that there's no um, just not this connection between where your coffee comes from. But I feel like it does need to come from a place of relationship with, um, with the brands you consume and as a consumer, just requesting that traceability. And I feel like that's where the change is going to come from. So from our side, from consumers, it's basically looking for the most direct way to reach the farmer and to know that it's coming from them, right? Exactly, yes. And speaking of the different farmers that you're working with, you must, I'm, I'm assuming you, you know all of their stories or most of their stories. Um, I don't know, maybe you want to, you want to tell us one of them, one story of, of one of your farmers that you found particularly touching. Yeah, I think 
well, there's a couple, but one that was very nice um, and we love uh, William. So he is from, from a mountain of Colombia. Um, and if you think about it, specialty coffee has the optimal conditions to grow. So if you are in certain altitudes, certain soil, you should be growing specialty coffee. Most farmers, they don't know this and they're just throwing it into the commodity pile. Uh, and so we found uh, William in this optimal condition, um, really small farm holder with a family and his dream is just to be able to get their family into, to educate them. Um, and so we started working with him and we realized that it took him very small tweaks to start changing um, their methods and hitting really high score. For example, um, we realized that at night he had his fermentation tanks, the temperature will drop and then it will stop the fermentation process through the coffee and therefore his quality will be low. Or um, where they were storing their coffee, there were other items that shouldn't be there. And so we start tweaking a little bit, very, very minor tweaks. And we're able to get him to a really good score. Um, and we got him for Google here in Silicon Valley to adopt him, where we were able to serve his coffee at the Google, at their corporate offices. And his picture was in the pods of the coffee. So the Googlers were able to know him. And the most beautiful things that we were able to bring William to the headquarters of Google in Silicon Valley, where he was able to tell his own story to the Googlers, see where the, his coffee was coming from and becoming a leader to his community and his mountain to be able to transform and let them know that it is important what they're doing because that's one of the biggest things that they feel so alone and, and just hidden in the mountains and they don't know why, why they do what they do. And so that was very powerful. Um, as well as then we were able to receive the sustainable, their sustainable team in Colombia, uh, you know, just uh, bridging the, uh, both worlds and both understanding what it meant to consume or buy or grow coffee. And so that I feel like was one of those beautiful stories that we were able to see our mission coming to life. Yeah, okay, that does sound really nice. I mean, we, we share this experience, not that it's very, very important to connect both sides because usually farmers and consumers do not have any points of contact. You usually don't know where your food or beverages come from. You don't know what exactly. went into its production. So, and they don't know who is going to consume their products. And as you say, since the life of most farmers is pretty hard, um, they probably, all of them might ask themselves at some point, why am I even doing this? Yes, <laughs> exactly. So that, that was an amazing story, uh, Maria. But um, William's story is one in hundreds of millions of families that depend on, on the coffee industry. And it's an industry that it's not very reliable, as we talked about. And sometimes the conditions are not the best. How do you, because I, I understand that you can, you can um, r rate the coffee based on those analyses you, you do. But how about the social conditions? How do you ensure that the farmers you're working with uh, are working and their employees are working in the best possible conditions? Yes, so the social uh, part is very critical. And that's why um, we create that platform called Beyond Trade, which means that we go even beyond fair trade, beyond direct trade, beyond all of that, because we realize that there's a whole issue at the farm level, at the human, social level because if you're working with a community that has been falling into poverty and inside that poverty cycle then there's a lot of social issues that have been ingrained through this struggle to put in like literally we have had our just text message from farmers like if you don't please buy a coffee to be able to put food in our table um and so it just goes it becomes very real and so one thing that we, we divide in different steps. So for us, the first step is getting more money to their hands. And so how can we increase their income, make sure they are profitable, make sure they, you know, they, they have the right income and they're able to invest into their land. And from out of um, these issues, many things happen. First, you know, their kids are not able to go to their schools. So there's that lack of education, um, which that just creates another level 
of them to be able to break through. Then there is the side of if you're struggling, you start exploding your own land as well. So you're not using the right methods. You're not being organic. You're not using the right water treatments. You're not putting the right things into this into your into your farm or you're cutting the trees you're referring because you need to sell whatever you have in your land and that's why we don't start working just with farmers are already certified because they they're already in the other side we want to work with the ones that they are before that um and then at the same time then internally through the the workers at the farm there's also the issues because they are also at a, a in a different um environment um, and it goes through issues of drug addiction, of um, prostitution, and like it just gets very complex as we start unveiling all the social issues that are there. And so our first step, we work directly with each farmer, we meet them, we check their conditions. Uh, right now we're doing a survey to make sure we account with, with their, all of their conditions. Um, and then once we start getting more money into their hands, then we start working with them. Okay, how are you paying your employees? How are you treating the, the land? How are your kids? What are the conditions? And so um, we start working the, through layers. Um, so first getting more money, then we start working on their social and sustainability at the same time, as well as teaching them how to invest that money because we realize it's not, it's not only about putting more money into their hands, because then how, how are you going to spend it as well? That's a big issue, right? Um, and so teaching them how to invest it back efficiently into the land so they're able to capture more wealth for their families. Um, and, and then the program on just with the farmers and so on. So we have a, a, a person that works one-on-one -on -one with them to make sure this it's into account. But yeah, no, these social issues is something that we keep in mind and it's um, we're now going to expand our efforts to tackle even further issues into these communities. That's amazing. So it's basically starting with seeing the potential that they have for transformation. Then, of course, the, the transformation is not possible if uh, they don't have the money to go through that. And then it's supporting them in that transformation and making sure the money goes where it, sh where it should, right? Uh, exactly. With how many farmers do you do this? Because that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, so we have worked in total with 40 farmers. And right now we're about to enroll a community that has about 500 farmers. So, oh, wow. so we are right now um, about to expand our, our, our reach. So we are literally working on that expansion right now. So what is it like for you entering such a traditional industry? as the coffee sector is, because it's something that's been around for a long time. And I'm guessing people are used, or also farmers being quite traditional people by nature, usually, at least in our experience. Mm, what is that like disrupting such a traditional s sector? You come in and you're like, OK, people, we're going to do things differently from now on. Like, how do they react? How do you reach them? Yes. So it, it was it was challenging, I'll say that. We started working on Progeny four years prior than when we when we founded it, just because, like you say, has been such a traditional. It's a very at the same time, it's a very small community, and I grew up there. Um, and so when I came with this idea, and it's a very heavily male dominant uh, industry, and so they they wouldn't listen at the beginning when it was just an idea, and it took us four years to break through. When in 2016, then we were able to open when we had that crazy farmer. So we started with one farmer, crazy farmer is like, okay, yes, I'll work with you guys just because something needed to change. Um, but I feel like we were able to then um, show them through the results. So right now, as we were able to capture all these incredible clients, like all the tech companies here, and people start seeing, oh, no, no, this is real. Like we could actually get something different um, and for example having let's say William coming back to his community and be like oh no no this really works like you know they are paying they are being fair this is my coffee is better I'm being recognized now they are coming to us there is a fine dance because there are heavy players in the industry and so there, there is like 
you know, that dance that you need to work through to make sure you're able to operate in these conditions. But everybody's now tilting and looking. Just um, two weeks ago, we have an innovative farm where we uh, create low-cost solutions for the farmers. And we just have a lot going out there. Like we reduce 90% of water consumption, reforestation, generating agriculture. We do so many there. And the government sent a group of people to our farm with a teacher to teach them about coffee. And we ended up then teaching the, um, the teacher how we were doing things and he had nothing to say. And, um, and the government was, was about to remove all the helps for specialty coffee because he was like, that's not even profitable. Why are we even doing this? This program doesn't even work. And out of then seeing what we were doing, that we were able to keep that funding for the farmers. Um, and becoming our farm kind of like that beacon of education, which is uh, very interesting. So it has been just through proving uh, and, and that transparency. Yeah, I, I guess a lot of resilience along the way, four years for, to, to yes. get the, the thing started. Amazing. Um, you were saying before that you support them in the journey of transformation and you train them also in, in sustainability. Yeah, what's your what's yeah. your take on the um, environmental aspect of coffee production? I mean, you just mentioned, for example, the water consumption, because ninety percent reduction of water consumption that's uh, that's amazing. I'm assuming water consumption, as in a lot of these crops, plays a huge role for the environmental aspects, right? Yes, and not only in the farming, because in the coffee in the coffee part, you also have the processing, and so that's that's another exactly. thing too. Yeah. Yeah, so if just yesterday came out uh, an article that was reading saying that climate change is going to affect completely uh, the coffee production and it's going to be reduced by a lot because farmers, what the coffee grows at a very specific conditions, at a very, you know, on, on a special place in the world because of the altitude, the conditions, and so on. And the moment you feel that, then you're going to see lower yieldings, lower quality. And so, so it start uh, re and it's, they say they start going to be reduced where the coffee is going to be able to grow. And so we saw this issue coming. And so we created a, an innovative farm where it's a very, very hot conditions. The altitude is not there, meaning replicating where like the moment that the temperatures will go up and how we can mitigate that. Um, and so we set out this journey. We didn't know if we were going to succeed. <laughs> it was because uh, it takes like three years to grow just the coffee plant. Fast forward three years uh, into the project, we just got the first crop and it was heavily successful. We were able to reach a 987 score coffee, mitigating all the effects of climate change. And so how we did that, um, first, like you said, the water consumption. So it takes 50 liters of water to produce one kilo of coffee. If you think about that at this as a world scale, that's just like soccer pools of water. And so we created a, 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 some innovative method that we were able to take it to 0 0.02 liters of water to produce one kilo of coffee. Nice. And in that, we created a very low cost uh, water system that is able to recycle the water four times. So even in that reduction, we're using the same water four times. And then it comes out clean to the soil. Um, out of that, we also reforest the whole area um, and we did diverse crops. And we did with the diverse crops, making sure that whatever we're putting in the field, once it falls into the ground, is actually adding the nutrients back into the ground. So it's a whole really interesting program um, that now we are rolling out to the farm to our own farmers right now we're able to eliminate all pesticides um, and move to completely organic matters uh, using organic matter and so it has been really interesting that now we'll be able to start moving and putting all of these findings back into the farmers to make sure that as the temperatures start rising hopefully we are all able to mitigate these but we are able to mitigate the effects and help them transition through this process. Um, so it has been a very exciting journey. At the end in sustainability, everything is kind of connected, right? Yes, exactly. exactly. So let's go back to talk a bit about coffee itself. Why is Colombian coffee considered the best in the world? Why is it the most famous? 
Yeah, um, I think if it has the, a few few items. Um, it's the soil. So in Colombia, there's different climates where you have different soils, thermic, uh, thermic floors, and different conditions that makes it very prompt uh, for the, um, the bean to grow and be very complex. As well as when you have different thermic floors, you're able to grow many different things surrounding. So through pollinization, you get a lot of flavor into, um, into, into the beans. Um, as well as still Colombia does it all by hand, where let's take um, countries like Brazil, which is all dignified and it's all machinery due to our you know, conditions that are really high mountains, it's all people picking a berry by berry. And so there's a very, very label, uh, hand labor uh, intensive process that is very well taken care of. And so I feel like it's that care, those conditions that makes it optimum uh, for our coffee to be in such a high quality. As um, also another thing is, because um, it, it all goes into the care that is put into, right? One bad bean that is in their fermentation tank that was left there will ruin completely the whole batch. And so you'll see that it's, you know, even though once they pick the coffee, then they hand select the coffees. So there's like five different steps of hand selection, the coffee, which is pretty interesting. So it's that care that we put into um, that makes it so special. So um, we see that uh, the trend of coffee is increasing and increasing. Can it be sustainable? To, and is it affordable to produce so much coffee sustainably? Are we, or do, should we pay more for coffee? How, how is, does it work? It is sustainable to start growing this way. Now it does take, it does cost a little bit more, right? Because it needs more care. It's more easy for us. It will be more easy, right? To just pick whatever is in the tree, put pesticides, put all the asteroids, kind of like in human beings, into the land, like I, I call it. So it looks bright and shiny, put machinery, shake the trees, bring it all down. And at the roasting facility, over roasted where you don't know. If I use pesticides, if it was a good quality or not good quality. And that's where you get at the supermarket when you purchase low price of coffee. You're getting um, just chemicals there. You are participating to a poverty loop. Uh, but when you buy specialty coffee, well-sourced coffee, it does have more care because we're not, there's not use of pesticides. Um, it's hand-picked. Every bean, it's hand peak, it's taken care of. There's the right methods. Um, and therefore it costs more to the farmer to do all of these, um, all, of, all of these steps. And that's why it, you know, it costs a little bit more, especially because um, you know, at, at the commodity level, farmers are not producing. So eventually, naturally we need to pay them more. We cannot expect them to be fair trade for certified if we're not already if we're not willing to pay them fairly. Well, Maria, as a huge coffee addict myself, and I think Chris uh, as well, a lot of us working people are. I'm guessing. Um, I would. I think I could talk about coffee for the rest of the day, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you also for our listeners and those watching the video for being with us for another episode. We hope you enjoyed this little field trip into the world of coffee production. And until next time, bye. Bye.